Hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining me today. So this lecture was created to try to help illustrate all of the ways that adrenal hormones and neurotransmitters are interconnected. Testing adrenal function and neurotransmitter levels together can provide a broad view of the body's functional neuroendocrine status. The doctor's data neuroadrenal profile is really an excellent tool because it allows us to assess patients who have concerns associated with things like stress, chronic illness, mood disorders, anxiety, addiction, chronic pain, immune deficiency, and even sexual dysfunction. So I hope that after this talk, you'll feel comfortable using and interpreting the neuroadrenal profile and developing target treatment approaches that will balance adrenal hormones and neurotransmitters in order to improve patient symptom. And a quick note, sometimes I find myself saying MTs instead of neurotransmitters. Now you know what that means. Okay, so you can see that many of the symptoms listed here would be uh, either alone or in combination, typically considered what we would um, often call mental illness. But issues like depression often include, in addition to mood concerns, things like insomnia, cravings, compulsions, fatigue, pain, low libido, et cetera. So as we move through this lecture, I want you to keep this in mind because often the research that I cite will be discussing depression, quote unquote. But I did want to stress that when I think of depression, it's really a grouping of symptoms like the ones I just mentioned, not just feelings of sadness. All right, this is the report you will receive if you run a neuroadrenal profile. So the report on the left is the adrenal portion. This is a salivary collection that allows us to report four diurnal points of cortisol as well as a DHEA value. And then the report on the right reflects the nine primary neurotransmitters. This is a urine collection. So to give you a little bit of a roadmap today, I'm going to begin by talking about stress and the HPA axis, and then I'll move into how that's related to neurotransmitter secretion. So how are these two things related? There are a lot of conditions that affect both adrenal hormones and neurotransmitter levels, and many symptoms can be a sign of imbalance in one or both of these symptoms. But there's really one common link. And the reason that you're probably going to be likely to reach for this profile, and that's stress and stress-related conditions, right? Who doesn't have stress? Now, assessing the status or function of a patient's HPA axis is not the same thing as identifying the unique stressors that are contributing to that status or dysfunction. So this is a illustration that was developed by Thomas Williams, PhD. Quick plug for Dr. Williams, he has written what I think is the most comprehensive book on the subject. You can see here the citation at the bottom. It's called The Role of Stress in the HPA Axis in Chronic Disease Management. So he's created this diagram. And you can see here most of the modifiable stressors that are identified can be collected into just a few simple categories. So here we're looking at circadian disruption, inflammatory signals, glycemic dysregulation, and then here in the top left, this is perceived stress. So this diagram is depicting both the initiating symbol for symptoms, and this is this outer line. So you can see for circadian disruption, there might be things like pain, caffeine shift work, for inflammation, allergies, inflammation, et cetera. I did want you to note, though, that in the perceived stress quadrant, these initiating signals are mostly filtered through neuronal pathways that are impacted by neurotransmitter secretion and also neurosteroids and endocannabinoids and glucocorticoid signaling. So unlike the filtered responses that drive the anticipatory nature of the perceived stress response, the other three categories of signals have more of a direct effect on the stress response because we need to quickly respond to homeostatic challenges that are happening with glycemic dysregulation or inflammation. In most patients with chronic HPA axis dysfunction, creating strategies to help us identify specific stressors and modify these stressors, typically coming from one of these categories, is going to result in the greatest improvement in the stress response and ultimately help us rebuild metabolic reserves and slow chronic disease progression. Okay, let's think about the stress response. Our stress response begins in the brain when we perceive a threat. 
The hypothalamus immediately triggers catecholamine release, and this is uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, and this is depicted on the left-hand side of this diagram. So those neurotransmitters increase heart rate and blood pressure, and when catecholamines are higher early in the stress response, you can sometimes get a concomitant rise in some of the inhibitory neurotransmitters, such as GABA, and we'll touch on more of this later. But it's the epinephrine and norepinephrine that immediately kick in to trigger the stress response. And then moments or minutes later, the HPA axis responds, causing the release of ACTH and then cortisol and DHEA. Then when the cause of the stress is gone, cortisol produces negative feedback to stop the stress response. But let's think about chronic stress and let's use years of a global pandemic as an example. This chronic stress can actually lead to depleted cortisol levels. So you can see here, and again, we'll talk more about this later, but because norepinephrine, epinephrine, and cortisol are also intimately required for the stress response, um, there are some markers that can help us monitor dysregulation. And one of them is the norepinephrine to epinephrine ratio. And I will talk more about this later, but the reason it's pointed out here is because cortisol is an important cofactor in the conversion between those catecholamines. Serotonin there is involved in healthy HPA axis function because it facilitates the release of ACTH by the pituitary, which then promotes release of cortisol and DHEA. So low serotonin can contribute to low cortisol secretion, but additionally, low cortisol can actually be caused by stress because stress inhibits tryptophan hydroxylase, which is the enzyme that converts tryptophan to 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP. So one little treatment pearl here is that if you're trying to support a patient with low serotonin and you know that they're experiencing significant stress, you may have better luck clinically if you uh, supplement with 5-HTP rather than tryptophan because you're skipping that rate limiting step that can be slowed by stress. Of course, we still want to address the stress, but that might speed up the patient's response to your treatment. Now, the link between chronic stress and inflammation is essential to understand. Inflammation is, at least in part, the etiology behind every chronic disease. We know that chronic stress can drive inflammation, and that inflammation can deplete serotonin and the, and the catecholamines, as well as brain-derived neutrophic factor. And then you can see here that BDNF enhances the activity of tryptophan hydroxylase so that when it's low, serotonin levels may also be low. There are a variety of conditions that are associated with HPA axis dysregulation, but depression is a really important one. Research from the past 40 years has reliably found a connection between the HPA axis activation and depression. And in fact, some antidepressants are believed to work partially because they actually regulate glucocorticoids. Now, this slide depicts a meta-analysis of studies that looked at the association of cortisol and ADHD. And research indicates that childhood ADHD is associated with low cortisol levels. Medications like Ritalin that can help control ADHD have actually been shown to increase cortisol levels. Functional medicine docs may find that assessing and improving cortisol levels when it's warranted might be relevant in uh, treating ADHD. It is important to address stress with every patient because it can contribute to the development of some of the most common diseases and health issues. Uh, stress increases the likelihood of health behaviors that can lead to things like type 2 diabetes. Um, it can also directly raise the blood sugar in diabetics. One study compared women who were caring for a chronically ill child to those who were not and found that their chromosomes actually showed the effects of accelerated aging. And this was due to the stress of caregiving. Similarly, elderly individuals who are caregivers for their spouses have a 63% higher rate of death than age-matched individuals who are not caregivers. So testing the HPA axis can give you a good baseline of information and help you narrow treatment and then, of course, uh, monitor treatment progress. So prior to doing a diurnal cortisol test, it's really important to walk your patients through how to prepare for salivary testing, especially if they're using glucocorticoids. They need to avoid them for five days before the test. Um, this is all in the instructions included with the kit, but I think it can be helpful for you to talk about this with your patients 
while you're dispensing the kit because sometimes they're not aware of things that contain hydrocortisone. This is typically creams that controls redness or itching. Sometimes people can be exposed to creams through maybe putting it on a pet. They don't realize that they're absorbing it too. Asthma inhalers contain hydrocortisone sometimes, and we've even seen medicated lip balm contain hydrocortisone. So all of these things should be avoided for five days if possible. Otherwise, you're testing what's in the medicine instead of what's being secreted by the patient. Another quick pearl is that first saliva collection needs to be 30 minutes after waking. This is really important because in a healthy patient, this is the point when cortisol levels are at their highest point in a 24-hour period, and that's when we want to catch the first cortisol secretion. You can see here the phase zero. This, this, these graphs are depicting the three different phases that doctor's data acknowledges when you receive results. So your patient's results will fit into one of these categories. We like to do this because we find it can be helpful in you making appropriate treatment choices. And it can also show you how important it is to test because the symptoms can often be the same, right? I'm tired. I'm not sleeping. I've got low motivation, et cetera. Every single person, every single one of these phases can have those same symptoms. And so testing allows you to see exactly where a patient is falling. So here, just to talk through some of those phases in a little more detail, phase zero is a healthy response. Phase one encompasses a few different patterns. Either the AM value is high or we're seeing elevations at time of day when we shouldn't. And so that's typically if you see higher levels of cortisol at any point in the day, that would be a phase one. And then phase two is evolving, usually suboptimal or low AM cortisol level wanting thereafter. And phase three might be what we call in, us, in slang terminology, a flat liner. This is significant overall hyposecretion. And then I'm sure these are all treatments that you're familiar with. When we think about supporting the HPA axis, this is a handout that we have available on our website, but you can see here that for whatever phase, vitamins and adaptogenic herbs can be helpful. Of course, in the lifestyle modifications, these are typically a little bit harder for patients to adapt and can take longer to help. So sometimes supplements can help be a bridge to help people get there. So a few nuances that I use when choosing treatments, I typically reserve phosphorylated serine for elevated cortisol levels. I typically reserve adrenal glandulars for phase two or three. And it's typically only phase three when I would consider physiological doses of oral hydrocortisone therapy. So here I've just listed some of the specific herbs and lifestyle practices that, that I'll use to lower cortisol. Yoga can be added, especially if there are higher levels at night as a bedtime routine, but it's been proven to lower cortisol and improve a person's perception of their own stress level. Some exercise can, act, can calm cortisol levels, but generally these are more gentle exercises like yoga or walking or even slow jogging or swimming. Working out at a time when your energy is better can help minimize cortisol spikes following a, a workout. So often that's earlier in the day, but not necessarily always, but generally that's true. Forest bathing or walking in the woods for about two hours a week can lower cortisol levels. And then supplements can be taken at specific times to target high cortisol levels seen on testing. For example, if someone had an aberrant cortisol spike in the afternoon, I would give the phosphatidylserine at that time of day to try to help lower that. And then Bonobili is also a supplement to consider. To raise cortisol, supplements can be dosed generally right when people wake up and then maybe an optional second dose around midday. Typically, you're thinking about vitamins and adaptogenic support. These, of course, can be used whether cortisol levels are high or low, but certainly if cortisol is low, high-intensity workouts often result in higher cortisol secretion. But if somebody's not very active when they come to you, they need to gradually increase the intensity of their workouts as the fitness levels improve because jumping into extreme uh, exercise too fast can actually be a stress on the adrenals. Okay, so in addition to cortisol, the neuroadrenal test measures DHEA, which is an adrenal hormone. It's also a pro-hormone that can convert into testosterone and the estrogens, um, specifically estrone, which becomes estradiol. So that is something to keep in mind if you're ever thinking of supplementing with DHEA, is that it can affect testosterone and estradiol levels. So here is a little histological section of the adrenal cortex. There are three zones that secrete things. 
DHEA is produced in a different zone of the adrenal cortex than cortisol. So you can see the outermost layer, the glomerular fibrosa, is where aldosterone is secreted. The fasciculata is where cortisol is secreted, and then the reticularis is where the DHEA is secreted. The zone of reticularis develops in early childhood, and that's why DHEA begins to rise at around age six, uh, because it seems to be triggering the beginning of puberty. And then it typically peaks around age 20 to 25, and then it slowly declines thereafter. In adulthood, DHEA plays a role in the stress response um, because ACTH triggers the secretion of DHEA just like it does cortisol. Um, DHEA can elevate mood, calm emotions, increase alertness, really helps us cope with stress and can even improve memory. DHEA can be helpful to monitor in patients who have anxiety or depression because optimal DHEA levels are associated with better treatment outcomes. Optimizing DHEA may be necessary for neurotransmitter-focused treatments to work. So, so symptoms of imbalance that you might expect to see, if DHEA is low, you might see low motivation, decreased libido, depression, fatigue, and even short-term memory loss. If it's high, we generally will see things that are a little bit more sex hormone focused via elevated androgens. So acne, scalp hair thinning, an increase in facial or body hair in females. So essentially they can lose hair on the top of the head and then it can be sprouting out in places that we don't want it to be. And also things like insomnia and irritability. So how do you dose it? Studies have shown, and this is just an example, males with Addison's disease can require up to about 70 milligrams of DHEA daily. But in people who just have a functional or age-appropriate decrease in DHEA that we are trying to optimize, the potencies that we would choose are significantly lower. So generally in males, you're looking at 15 to 50. I generally start at 25. And in females, up to 25, but I typically start at about 10 milligrams. You can give it orally. It's actually one of those hormones that's pretty well absorbed when taken orally, but it can also be given sublingual or topically. Now, I do want to note that when DHEA is combined in a transdermal hormone cream with other hormones, especially progesterone, it does seem to interfere with the absorption of these other hormones, especially progesterone. This is not something I've seen in the literature. This is something I've seen just after looking at tens of thousands of salivary hormone profiles over the years. If DHEA is elevated, there are two reasons why you might see it. One is stress. I guess three three reasons. One could be excess supplementation. So you would want to adjust. But if the patient isn't supplementing, stress can uh, cause elevations in DHEA. Because remember, as ACTH is elevated to try to trigger the, the secretion of more cortisol, it also triggers the secretion of more DHEA. But in women, High androgen, DHEA included, may be an early sign of insulin resistance from metabolic syndrome. In patients who have PCOS-like symptoms, you might want to work them up and see if DHEA levels are high, and you would want to then look at hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, insulin secretion, that sort of thing. And there's lots of ways to help to decrease androgens. If blood sugar dysregulation is the issue. That's where you want to focus your attention. But then there's some literature that suggests things like green tea, marjoram tea, or even spearmint can help to uh, reduce levels of DHEA. Okay. The second part of this profile is neurotransmitter. So we'll shift our focus now. So just a quick review. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that regulate emotional processes and physical processes, things like movement, stress response, pain, cognition. They function in the central nervous system, but also in the periphery, and they facilitate communication between the brain and the body's glands, organs, and muscles. I do want to note the urinary neurotransmitter testing that we offer does represent whole body secretion, not just CNS secretion, but we have found that corresponds very well with patient symptoms and with response to the treatments that you choose based on the imbalances of your urinary test. So in addition to the mental symptoms we might expect to see with neurotransmitter imbalance, there are a lot of physical manifestations as well because there are pathways that connect the nervous system to the adrenal gland, the cardiovascular system, the GI tract, the immune system, and 
the muscles. Receptors for neurotransmitters exist all through the body, not just in the CNS. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, but this is often the types of symptoms that we think of when we are considering neurotransmitter testing. Things like the mental health symptoms, right? ADHD, cognitive concerns, anxiety, depression, addictions, compulsions, et cetera, but even physical symptoms like chronic pain or headaches or IBS or issues with weight, cravings, that sort of thing. So in my own practice, I have seen that almost everybody who walks in the door suffers from at least one, if not all, of these four symptoms. Issues with mood, issues with fatigue, insomnia, and issues with focus and attention. So neurotransmitter testing is really a crucial part of my workup. Pharmaceuticals like SSRIs are commonly prescribed to manage mood, but despite these drugs being the most common intervention for anxiety and depression, research indicates that some SSRIs may work no better than placebo. So there's three different studies here. The second one looked at long-term antidepressant users and found that about three quarters of them experienced withdrawal when discontinuing. And lastly, a meta-analysis found that about 50% of depressed patients treated with antidepressants relapsed, while only about half as many who were treated with placebo experienced relapse. So there seems like there might be better ways to address these types of symptoms. So a question we commonly get is, because these prescriptions are so commonly prescribed, can I test a patient who is currently using some sort of psychotropic medication? The answer is yes. It's not necessary to discontinue any medically necessary daily prescriptions for the purposes of testing, but you do want to make sure that the urine collection is done in the morning prior to the first dose. Generally, the first void of the day is what's collected, so that's not too challenging to do. I do want to note that if you're testing neurotransmitters for patients who are using drugs like SSRIs, what you do is you simply look at the result through the lens of the influence of the SSRI. This actually gives you valuable information for how the patient's uh, neurotransmitter levels look under the influence of the medication and how you can support them while they're still taking it. Now, if they want to wean it, that's great. Sometimes we can support other imbalances that help make the weaning process better. If you are really feel strongly about testing endogenous levels, what you're going to want to do is wait at least half, five half lives after discontinuation to test the patient's urine. For neurotransmitter imbalance, you can Google the medication the patient is taking and it'll tell you how long the half life is. And then you multiply that times five. And you wait at least that amount of time before testing. Generally, five half-lives gets you back to baseline. For PRN meds, like meds for allergies, headache, et cetera, best to avoid those if possible. Another thing that you need to be avoided before collection is there are certain foods that can't be eaten in the 48 hours before testing. And that's because the foods that you can see listed here either contain precursors that can increase serotonin or catecholamine levels. This is analogous to avoiding eating a Danish on the morning a patient is going to get their glucose uh, levels tested, right? So if patients eat these foods in the two days before they collect uh, their urines for neurotransmitter testing, it could artificially elevate the serotonin and the catecholamines. And so you're essentially testing the foods rather than the endogenous level. So 48 hours to avoid these foods. And then for 24 hours before, it's best to avoid caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol, as well as strenuous exercise, as these things can help. The, these things often make patients release higher amounts of catecholamine. So avoiding that allows you to get a baseline level. Okay, treatment. This is probably what a lot of us are here for, right? This is what we want to know is how can we start, uh, help our patients? So I'm going to start by talking about treatment strategies in a very general way, and then I'll share some specific recommendations for various neurotransmitter imbalances. So a common underlying cause of mental health problems, such as depression, is inflammation. So I wanted to start this section with another nod to inflammation because inflammation hijacks neurotransmission. It's almost always an issue when you find imbalances. So remember that inflammation was also one of the four main categories of stress that impacts the HPA axis, if you remember that illustration that Thomas Williams made. 
stress and inflammation are two strong factors as to why a provider would want to test neurotransmitters in the HPA at the same time. So on the left here is um, a list in green. This was published uh, in Psychiatric Times. These are factors that may indicate inflammation or, or even potentiate inflammation. That's probably a better word to say. Um, obesity, being sedentary, ACEs, not sleeping, having infection. You can see those things listed here. I think I would add smoking and poor diet to the list, but you get the idea. Now, through multiple mechanisms, and these are all listed here in these blue boxes, inflammation results in higher glutamate, lower monoamines, and BDNF levels, which can result in psychiatric conditions, especially depression and anxiety. The article lists some helpful considerations when treating mental health, including assessing whether inflammation might be the root cause. They recommend not using SSRIs as a first-line therapy, and also they recommend implementing lifestyle intervention, things like sleep, exercise, meditation. I will add to this list nutrition. We all understand the importance of that. Okay, so when we're thinking about treatment, I find it really helpful to look at the biochemical pathways. This is a map of how the neurotransmitters are synthesized and how they convert and metabolize. So a copy of this uh, biochemical pathway is included with every neurotransmitter report that you get. And so you might find that looking at this alongside the patient's result can help you see the big picture. You might start to notice patterns as well as help you come up with tailored treatment plans. And I often find that showing this to my patients helps them understand my thought process and how I'm thinking about things. So Let's say we wanted to, where's my cursor? If we were worried about low serotonin, we consider tryptophan, the amino acid precursor, or 5-HTP, that second option. We would think about the activity of these enzymes and how we might be able to support them. You might also consider how they're being metabolized. You can see here the key if the neurotransmitters are too low, generally we're thinking about providing the precursors. So again, tryptophan or 5-HTP for serotonin, phenylalanine or tyrosine for the catecholamines, et cetera. If the neurotransmitters are too high, you would consider supporting the MAO and COMT enzymes, which help to metabolize them. So vitamin D and iron are two important cofactors uh, that affect the rate-limiting steps in the production of serotonin and the so if the monoamines are low, testing vitamin D and ferritin uh, is certainly a consideration. So here I listed the amino acids and cofactors that can help to address each deficiency. Um, in some cases, the neurotransmitter is itself an amino acid. Uh, these are things like GABA, glycine, and phenethylamine. So you don't absolutely have to give cofactors as well uh, if you're giving the neurotransmitter itself. Code factors may not be as helpful, but it is possible that the neurotransmitter might be low due to a need for vitamin support. So here you've got uh, listed the neurotransmitter, the amino acids that help to support it, and then the code factors that help um, support the enzymes that make those neurotransmitters. Now, if there's two lines listed, you certainly don't have to give both, but they're uh, given there as options for you. Uh, often it's an either or scenario. As a general rule, these are best absorbed when taken on an empty stomach. And my rule for an empty stomach is at least 30 minutes before or two hours after a meal. Activated forms of cofactors are typically more effective for symptom management, especially if there's any trouble with methylation. So things like B12 best and folate best in the methylated forms, vitamin B6 best in the pyridoxal 5-phosphate form, et cetera. Methylation is critical for neurotransmitter synthesis. Methylated folate is a cofactor for many of these enzymes. So anywhere you see the cofactor BH4 or SAMe, that means it is methyl dependent. So the biochemistry is here, just for your reference. But the bottom line is that if methylation is impaired, so will be the production of many of the neurotransmitters. Let's take an example of the neuro transmitter portion of the neuroadrenal report. If you look at the pattern on this report with the monoamines, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, you can see that they're all low. 
what are we, what do we need to consider when we think about etiologies behind low monoamines? The first, as I've tried to hammer home, is inflammation. Can we identify a source of inflammation in this patient? A se second thing to consider is, are there MTHFR variants? Does this patient have an issue with methylating? Additionally, are there vitamin D or iron deficiencies? Because we know these are required for monoamine synthesis. So now you're already on your way to recognizing patterns and interpreting these reports from a holistic root cause pers uh, perspective. Now, remember, there's about a week or so between collection and getting the results. You can always start your patient on some lifestyle stuff, good nutrition, correcting any known vitamin deficiencies, exercise, sleep hygiene, omega 3 stress reduction, et cetera. <clears throat> rhodiola is a really valuable herb to have in your toolkit. A low dose of rhodiola is helpful for the low levels of things like serotonin and catecholamine because this is an adaptogenic herb that can help to optimize cortisol levels as well as neurotransmitters. But I do want to note that you're going to see us recommend rhodiola for both low and elevated levels of certain neurotransmitters. Generally, lower doses support low neurotransmitter levels, but very high potencies of rhodiola can actually calm elevation. L-theanine is another therapeutic option for many different kinds of imbalances. It promotes relaxation. It improves mood and focus. It's derived from green tea, but getting a therapeutic dose from tea is very difficult. It would take so many cups of tea in a day to equal what we can get supplementally. Generally, we recommend that L-theanine be dosed at least twice daily because it has a shorter half-life than some of the other amino acids. Meditation is also so helpful in this context. Regular meditation has been associated with higher serotonin levels, lower norepinephrine levels, uh, better dopamine, better GABA, and even uh, mel melatonin. And fish oil, one of my favorite anti-inflammatory therapies. I like fish oil rather than cod liver oil because fish oil contains both EPA and DHA. EPA has the anti-inflammatory properties in DHA, which is vital to some of the structures in the brain and the nervous system. Adequate doses of fish oil actually have been shown to have antidepressants. And I wanted to mention St. John's wort. It's an option for low serotonin. I'm mentioning it because it's very well studied. It's an herb that has been shown to provide equivalent relief of mild to moderate depression when compared to SSRIs. It seems to be via, act via, at least one of the mechanisms seems to be monoamine oxidase inhibition. So it slows the metabolism of serotonin. But I do want to remind you to use it with caution because St. John's wort is metabolized via some common cytochrome pathways. And so there are some really common meds that can have interactions with. And these include things like oral contraceptives. So many of our patients are on those and even things like warfarin and digoxin. Okay, so now I want to go through the neurotransmitters tested on this profile and get into some of the details so you can think about adjusting treatment plans based on specific imbalances. So again, starting with serotonin, it's biochemically derived from the amino acid tryptophan. Interestingly, it's primarily found in the gastrointestinal tract. So some, but not all, of the symptoms of imbalanced serotonin are listed here. We can see changes in body temperature. In fact, hot flashes and night sweats of menopause are actually now known to be associated with uh, low serotonin levels. We can see pain, depression, suicidal ideation, racing thoughts, and obsessions. So as we move through the types of symptoms you might expect to see with the various neurotransmitter imbalances we're discussing, I want you to note how often the same symptoms appear. You'll see mood concerns associated with many different neurotransmitters. You'll see cognitive concerns come up a lot. This is one of the reasons why I think testing is so essential. It's very difficult to guess what neurotransmitter level is affecting a specific symptom picture. There will be a treatment slide for every neurotransmitter I discussed today. I don't have the time to walk you through each of these for every neurotransmitter, but I'm, I'm going to walk you through this first one just so you're familiar with the approach. These are some of the strategies that you might consider 
when serotonin is in balance. Here on the left, when serotonin is low, you might consider tryptophan, the amino acid precursor, or 5-HTP, that halfway point. Rhodiola in lower potency. Melatonin, actually, you can see serotonin becomes melatonin, but more on why we might give melatonin to support serotonin in just a minute. l -theanine. Sometimes we joke that this is the adaptogen of the neurotransmitter system. It comes up when things are too low or too high. And then all of these cofactors that can help these enzymes work more efficiently. If serotonin is high, again, L-theanine, rhodiola in higher potencies, and the cofactors that help to support the metabolism, moving serotonin into its metabolite 5-HIA. Melatonin supplementation may be an alternative way to boost serotonin levels. So the pathway from serotonin to melatonin is now thought to be bidirectional. And this is after a 2016 study found evidence of this. Generally, a half milligram to about three milligrams at night is a pretty typical dose um, that's effective for an adult if you're trying to improve sleep onset latency. Uh, and now you know that it may also improve serotonin levels as well. All right, let's move on to the next neurotransmitter, dopamine. People with extroverted personality types tend to show higher levels of dopamine activity than people with introverted personalities. This neurotransmitter stimulates the reward and pleasure centers in the brain. It also affects movement and behavior, allowing us to move toward an instant reward. And the reward response is enhanced, especially if the reward received is greater than expected. Remember when you were a child and your mom or dad gave you a quarter to put into a gumball machine. And if you put the quarter in and turned the crank and then a big shiny gumball dropped into your hand, that was pretty exciting. But did you ever have the experience of putting in the quarter, turning the crank and having two gumballs drop into your hand? That elation you felt at having that unexpected extra gumball, that was driven by dopamine. So dopamine is a catecholamine. These are derived from the amino acid tyrosine, and dopamine then converts into the other catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine. And a quick note, outside of the United States, these are often referred to as noradrenaline and adrenaline. This is how people with excess dopamine may see the world. Things that once seemed safe and comfortable no longer do. So you might see symptoms like increased worry, paranoia, ADHD, a decreased ability to interact socially, and a desire for instant gratification. And then conversely, dopamine deficiency is associated with Parkinson's disease. Also mood swings, depression, anxiety, and a loss of motivation. There are even some pathological states, things like schizophrenia, autism, ADHD, and restless leg syndrome that are associated with dopamine deficiency. Dopamine is sometimes called the motivation molecule. Lab mice that are dopamine deficient are so apathetic, they will literally starve themselves to death, even when food is readily available. That's how important dopamine is to motivation. And so here are some options to support dopamine. What about massage? Always a great prescription to give our patients, right? Studies suggest massage can decrease salivary cortisol and also increase urinary serotonin and dopamine. Dopamine converts to norepinephrine and then to epinephrine. And these, as we know, are associated with the fight or flight response. So these catecholamines are secreted from the adrenal gland and they affect heart rate heart rate, blood pressure, release of glucose through energy stores, et cetera, things that allow us to flee danger or fight danger. Um, this might explain why fasting increases norepinephrine. Um, sometimes people who are in intermittent fasting uh, may notice an increase in norepinephrine. Um, so just a little quick clinical note there. So the secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine, as we discussed, they coordinate the fight or flight response. They coordinate carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. So they're secreted from storage vesicles in the adrenal medulla in response to stress, any type of stress, and then help us release those reserves that we need to, to get out of harm's way. If levels of norepinephrine and epinephrine are low, 
Remember, these are excitatory neurotransmitters. So if we have low levels of them, we might see decreased concentration, poor attention and memory, brain fog, not wanting to get out there and socialize, not being alert, being depressed, not having any interest, and maybe some change. Conversely, if we have too much of these because they're excitatory, some of the physical symptoms you might see are palpitations, tachycardia, restlessness, hypertension, et cetera. And then on the mood side, irritability, agitation, anxiety, insomnia, lack of mental focus because the mind is racing. And then here are, of course, suggestions on supporting those catecholamines. Now, I did want to talk quickly about the norepinephrine to epinephrine ratio, which is calculated for you on this profile. So this ratio examines the conversion between norepinephrine and epinephrine. So this is one way to assess how stress affects neurotransmission because cortisol is an important cofactor in this conversion. So when this ratio is elevated, you will likely need to look at diurnal cortisol testing to help you fine tune your treatment strategy. And when cortisol levels are lower suboptimal, you know that typically contributing to that ratio being elevated. I think of the stress response as having uh, three phases. And I think it's important to identify these via testing so that we can support our patients appropriately. And that's because patients often present with the same symptoms, right? I've mentioned these. They're tired, they're depressed, they're anxious, they can't focus, they can't sleep. Patients experiencing these same symptoms can be at different phases of the stress response because everyone fatigues at different rates. And depending on the stage of the stress response, the treatments you choose can vary quite a bit. So if we think about the early stress response or phase one, what we typically expect to see is a hyper secretion of these markers. Generally, we'll see patients secreting excess amounts of cortisol and high amounts of epinephrine and norepinephrine. In these early stages, the body is typically very efficient at responding to stress. But the sympathetic nervous system is not designed to stay in high stress mode continuously for months and months. So the body starts to adapt. Now, some people might call this adrenal fatigue, but I do want to remind everybody that adrenal gland is not actually fatiguing. What we're actually observing is the sympathetic response and the HPA axis adapting to a constant onslaught of stressful stimuli. At this point, you might see some markers testing high and others testing low because the neurotransmitter and endocrine systems are starting to adapt to this constant stress. I will tell you that there's no expected thing to see here other than levels starting to drop. But I have observed after looking at so many of these over the years that epinephrine tends to stay high longer than cortisol and norepinephrine. And I think it's because epinephrine is so essential to the stress response. Then if we think of late stage or phase three, HPA axis dysfunction, now generally these systems are depleted. The patient is exhausted. People typically feel pretty lousy at this point because all of these markers are low. Again, there are no hard and fast rules governing these changes, but these changes are what I have observed in patients who have been dealing with chronic stress over time. So I just wanted to share that with you. So we're pretty familiar, I'm sure, all of us as functional docs is with the concept of using adaptogenic herbs to support the HPA axis, but you can also turn to adaptogens to support catecholamines because these are also secreted from the adrenal gland. They are secreted from the medulla rather than the cortex, but these adaptogens and some mushrooms can support the body in resisting and adapting to stress. Typically, these don't have adverse effects. We know that adaptogens can help regulate both the cortex and the medulla, whether the patient started high or started low. You may also consider nervine herb. You can see some of my favorites listed here. Generally, these are taken to calm anxiety, calm excess catecholamine. At night, they can help with sleep, but any time of day, they can help um, calm anxiety. Okay, I want to quickly take a look at a patient. How do we put all of this information we've been learning? Intention. This is Clark. Um, 
For now, I'm, I'm only focusing on uh, some of the neurotransmitters we've talked about so far. So Clark is 41 years old. He's a male. He's got anxiety, depression, symptoms that he's calling OCD, brain fog, and lots of stress. He also has trouble staying asleep. So you can see he has high and upper range serotonin and dopamine. So we can support these, the metabolism of these, via support of the COMT and MAO enzymes. So you would be looking at the cofactors that you can see to the right of those in orange. So B vitamins, iron, magnesium, methyl support. We could also encourage the conversion of dopamine downstream into norepinephrine and epinephrine. This is driven by the dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme. It requires vitamin C, copper, and niacin to work. So we'd want to make sure that there are appropriate amounts of those. Um, L-theanine could help modulate the monoamines and support relaxation. And of course, those lifestyle changes, yoga or the meditation, the deep breathing, sleep hygiene, et cetera. We want to address adrenal health because his health, uh, excuse me, his stress is significant. And you can see here that is consistent with what we're seeing here on his HPA access report. What we see here is what we call a phase two dysfunction. He's got suboptimal cortisol levels and even a low level in the evening. He's reported fatigue in the morning that worsens throughout the day. That's consistent with what we see here. Trouble staying asleep. Sometimes people think, oh, if cortisol levels are low at bedtime. These people are probably really tired, right? There's two things happening here. One is he's reaching bedtime levels essentially at noon. So that's why he's tired in the afternoon. And then the triggers for sleep aren't there because cortisol levels are low. And then on top of that, cortisol evening and night, this is the same value. The range has changed, which is why you've got a different representation there. But essentially, no triggers for sleep. He's ready for bed earlier in the day. So that's a problem. Okay. The neurotransmitters we've discussed so far are a little bit more linearly associated with the stress response, but I did want to uh, end this lecture by walking through the other neurotransmitters tested in the profile and talk about some of their actions and how they could still be contributing to the stress burden in the body's response. Um, many of these influence sleep, and so that is, of course, a big stressor. Insomnia is a huge stressor and a driver of inflammation. So any test that gives insight into why our patients aren't sleeping will be helpful. Now, so let's move on to glutamate. Glutamate is the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter in the body. It's really interesting to me that glutamate is molecularly similar to GABA, which is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the body, but the two have opposing neurological effects. So glutamate is crucial for memory and learning. It's involved in a process called long-term potentiation. This is a sudden but lasting increase in excitatory neurotransmission in the hippocampus that requires activation of glutamate receptors and inhibition of GABA receptors. So if you look at this graphic here, you can see that glutamate is promoting depolarization of the postsynaptic neuron that causes magnesium to stop blocking the receptor channel so that calcium can flow in and a memory is formed. Excess glutamate can be excitotoxic. It can damage brain cells by overstimulation. But we do need to have adequate levels because if levels are too low, we can see depression and brain fog and addictions and learning difficulties. So here's some ideas of how to support glutamate when it's low or high. Taurine and magnesium listed on the high side can actually protect against glutamate toxicity whereas NAC and the cofactors will help metabolize it. Now, moving on to GABA. So glutamate, the primary excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. So GABA has calming effects. GABA-A is the predominant receptor. This is the same receptor that's utilized by benzodiazepine drugs. So anything that we do that stimulates GABA-A receptors can be helpful in treating anxiety, even seizures, and it may act as a sedative or muscle relax. <clears throat> Low GABA, so remember, it's inhibitory. So if you don't have enough of the inhibition, you may see panic, anxiety, depression in these symptoms. And then if someone has too much of this inhibitory neurotransmitter, then you might see drowsiness, difficulty concentrating, diminished memory, mood, et cetera. Sometimes a patient who has panic and anxiety will have low GABA, but other times, 
It could be high as a compensatory response to elevated excitatory neurotransmitters. So GABA levels that are high are not always a uh, um, significant finding. If your patient has too much excitatory activity, the body in an effect to maintain homeostasis may elevate GABA levels as a compensatory mechanism. And here's some ideas about using GABA or excuse me, addressing low or high GABA. All right, histamine, we think about histamine as making a sneeze, right? But that's just the tip of the iceberg. If we think of histamine as a neurotransmitter, it can increase metabolism, promote wakefulness, learning and memory, and suppress appetite. So when I'm trying to explain the activities of histamine to my patients, I generally am most concerned about it when it's elevated because elevated histamine really contributes to an inability to fall asleep. And this makes sense if we think about how some people use Benadryl to fall asleep. Dibenhydramine suppresses histamine, which is too high. And so then people are able to fall asleep. Some of those newer generation antihistamines like Claritin and Zyrtec, they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So they don't tend to cause involuntary napping like that Benadryl can. When histamine is low, you might see hunger, low mood, gut inflammation, dysbiosis can sometimes be involved when histamine is high. I do want to note that while you might see high urinary histamine in relation to an allergic response, you also might not because histamine is really rapidly metabolized. So the urine testing that you're doing for neurotransmitter secretion doesn't always correlate with the allergy symptoms your patient could be experiencing. And here's some ideas to support lows and highs. Glycine is a non-essential amino acid and also an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the CNS. Uh, it helps regulate the body's temperature during sleep. As a supplement, it can help postmenopausal women who have night sweat. Elevated levels can impair energy use in the CNS and result in poor cognition, and low levels may result in oxidative stress in neurons and can also contribute to poor sleep and memory issues. Here's some ideas for supporting low and high. I do want to note bone broth. Connective tissue in general contains glycine. So if your patient is low in glycine, you can certainly put them on bone broth. But if you find an unexpectedly elevated glycine, you also want to ask the patient what they're eating. Because if they're taking a collagen supplement or drinking a lot of bone broth, that could be causing uh, elevations in glycine. Phenethylamine is our last neurotransmitter on the neuroadrenal profile. It has stimulating and excitatory properties. Most importantly, though, we think about methylamine when low being associated with ADHD. In fact, three studies have confirmed that urinary PEA levels were significantly lower in patients with ADHD and that these levels normalize with treatments. And so urinary PEA could actually be considered a biomarker for the diagnosis of ADHD and then for evaluating treatment efficacy. Uh, and here's some ideas for supporting low and high. Now, quickly, I want to point out this detail. Uh, the precursor phenylalanine is, is generally what we think about for supporting PEA, but you can give PEA itself. Now, what we're looking for is phenethylamine. Do not confuse it with this toilethylonamide, which is also marketed as PEA. This is something that's typically used for pain management, and these are different substances. Okay, back to Clark. We were talking about PEA, which Clark has, but look at this. He also has elevated glycine. So the brain fog he's experiencing does correlate with that elevated glycine and the trouble concentrating he's reporting is consistent with the low PEA. Now, a quick note about glycine. I mentioned the bone broth and stuff. So you'd want to ask him about his diet, but glycine is also involved in the regulation of dopamine transmission and high levels can inhibit dopamine release in certain brain regions. So this could be a compensatory elevation because Clark has upper range dopamine. So we've already talked about giving him most of the cofactors to break down uh, dopamine and serotonin, which are the same as we would choose to break down glycine. An additional consideration might be alpha lipoic acid to assist in glycemic breakdown, but it may not be needed because we're treating the high dopamine already. And again, when PEA is low, you might consider its precursor phenylalanine or give phenethylamine itself. Okay. What about follow-up? When should you retest? 
So for neurotransmitters, we generally recommend six months after initial testing, but sooner, certainly, if significant changes in symptomology are observed. And then for the HPA axis testing, if you're giving hydrocortisone or DHEA, you typically want to check in at eight to 12 weeks after you've given those therapies to see how the patient is doing with them. Otherwise, six months to a year after testing would be appropriate. So what we've observed is that adrenal hormone secretion is slow to shift, but your patients are going to feel better a lot faster than that um, with the therapies you're providing. Okay, we're out of time, but I quickly want to do this case, Emily, just so we can um, have one last overview. So uh, her history was she's a full-time student, but I saw her during lockdown. So she was studying for home, feeling very isolated during the pandemic, we had been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, had low vitamin D levels, an erratic eating schedule. She was vaping tobacco, also cannabis at night. She said for sleep, drinking coffee in the morning and regularly drinking alcohol. She was taking Adderall, 15 milligrams in the morning, but it was not her prescription. She was taking it from a friend. She was on Deplin. This is a type of methyl l methylfolate helpful for those who have trouble with methylation and also Nexplanon for birth control. This symptom questionnaire you see here, this is included in the testing paperwork, and patients are encouraged to fill out their symptoms, either zero or one, two, three in terms of severity. So I've highlighted here Emily's most significant symptoms. You can see here it was a three out of three for depression, anxiety, stress, fatigue, addiction, unwanted facial hair, a little bit of acne and scalp thinning as well, and no libido. So what did we find with testing? A blunted cortisol curve. She was really struggling with the COVID lockdown. We also see a high DHEA. This can happen with stress. Remember, ACTH also responds, excuse me, ACTH when secreted from the hypothalamus triggers cortisol at least, as well as DHEA secretion. So this could be due to stress. This could also be, which is a little bit outside of today's uh, topic, but this could also be due to the PCOS that she reports because PCOS typically results in elevated DHEA and testosterone secretion. For neurotransmitters, we can see dopamine is elevated. This might be due to the Adderall that she's taking. I didn't really talk about cannabis today, but cannabis used acutely can cause increases in dopamine. Her glycine is elevated. This could be due to a protein powder that she often puts in her morning smoothies, but it could also be due to the dopamine elevation we see here. And then her PEA is low. This is common with attention deficits. So if we address this, it could help her with her focus and attention. You can be inattention. And then the norepinephrine and epinephrine are low or low range. That's consistent with her reported depression. She has very low motivation and low energy. And we know that those catecholamines are associated with both of those. All right. So a treatment plan. l she can take it as needed. I would say at least twice a day, but also during the day if it helps with feelings of anxiety, but try not to exceed about a thousand milligrams a day. The phenylalanine to support PEA, magnesium glycinate, because it's an important cofactor. Vitamin D, also an important cofactor. Liposomal melatonin, hopefully to replace cannabis at night or sleep. Fish oil because of its anti-inflammatory benefits. A multi because of all of the cofactors that are needed for appropriate activity of all of these enzymes, and then continue the Deplin. And then as far as lifestyle goes, when to talk about therapy and lifestyle coaching, because she's really been struggling with lockdown, try to incorporate 10 minutes of mindfulness meditation. I love the apps to help support this because it's really hard to sit down and calm your mind. Try to spend at least 15 minutes outside per day and commit to regular bedtime and wake schedule. For nine months later, you can see here, significant improvement. Her depression and anxiety are pretty much gone. Stress is much improved. Fatigue is much improved. That's in the morning. That's often what happens. But the acne and the addictive tendencies are still there. She's hooked on nicotine, right? That's a pretty difficult thing to kick. That'll probably be a long-term project to try to help her quit the nicotine and the acne that could be associated with PCOS. So we're probably gonna want to work up some blood sugar markers. Now you can see here with the cortisol, significant improvement. She went from phase two to phase one. The DHEA is higher though. 
she stopped her birth control and about four months before this test and had still not had a period. And again, outside of the topic today, but closely associated. So that's why I chose Emily is that we know that DHEA is not just associated with stress response. It could also be associated with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, PCOS. So if you find DHEA levels are not improving when you're addressing stress and you've got some of those other symptoms going on, you're going to want to work up your patients, particularly the women for fasting blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C, and potentially test other sex hormones as well. Okay. So if we look at uh, the neurotransmitter follow-up, you can see that these small triangles show you how the prior values compare to now. She's off Adderall and cannabis and the dopamine chain down. The norepinephrine doesn't really look like it, but this is slightly better. But more importantly, the epinephrine is improved. The glycine is improved. In general, things are more in the middle, and that's great. The PEA still hasn't budged, so I might switch from phenylalanine to actually PEA itself. So the main change now is going to be that switch to PEA from phenylalanine, do some labs to work up the blood sugar dysregulation and check on other sex hormones via salivary testing or urinary hormone testing. Okay. That's it. It's just to summarize, because stress is so pervasive and it affects every patient in some way, the neuroadrenal profile really can be a helpful addition to your workup. But of course, remember balancing neurotransmitters and adrenal health in order to improve symptoms involves more than just taking amino acids or adaptogenic herbs. We've got to avoid those substances that cause imbalance, things that drive inflammation and improve nutrition, address stress support enzymes, identify the root cause of that stress whenever possible. And so between doing that and analyzing the labs and symptoms together, we'll hopefully help our patients on their healing journey. All right. Thanks for your attention. Hi, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this class. If you're a practitioner, make sure you go sign up at rupahealth.com. And if you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe.